Uh, working with Neem is, a, for me, it's kind of a recent experience of the past couple of years. And I, I love this world that uh, you open up for interdisciplinary discussion and for discussion between academics and artists. So thank you so much. Um, this uh, project for me has been, so my background, I am a dramaturg by training, and then my, my uh, research work, uh, my scholarly work is in theater studies and cultural studies. And I find inter inter interdisciplinary work the most uh, interesting and the most rewarding. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, I'm very interested in Cyprus because a lot of the times that kind of <laughs> keeps us uh, bound, but uh, projects like these really do open up a new window. Uh, these are not um, processes that we are invited to explore very much, uh, especially when you have to do with theater and, and that type of work. Uh, many times you're trapped in cultural production. Um, so space uh, and the way that it inevitably develops is something that you forget. So um, this is the title that I came up with just a couple of days ago. So A Village at a Crossroads, Narratives of Development and Trauma. It was, I think, the most sincere title that I could come up with because over the past six months, um, this process for me was a process of uh, discovery, of self-discovery, um, and of, um, of finding out things, very, very surprising things, but also intuitively, in a way, very familiar things about a space um, that I wasn't, um, I wasn't very, very much um, familiar with, only by name. So that will make sense as I'm kind of going along. So I'm going to start from the very, very top. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the location, but first let me introduce my approach. So the area of Lobetri and its environs, the build-up area, the orchards and the Potamos, which is the river area, has entered well behind other communities in the area, the phase of what is widely called development. The paper proposes a sociocultural and historic approach in our effort to understand the ways with which this process is taking place. So how is it taking place? It takes the form of a, of a research journal based on the visual and testimonial narratives harvested by the researcher. The analysis, focuses, the analysis focuses on collective memory as that has been formulated from the late 1950s onwards how memory and trauma have been preserved, their manifestations in public and private spaces, as well as ways with which these narratives are acutely gendered. The research draws from the locations in and around the village, as those relate to past trauma, archival footage related to the predominant narratives which dominate the identity of the village, interviews which were carried out in the spring of 2023 with uh, Lyobedri inhabitants across generations, and area maps, which is what I'm starting from. The research asks the following questions. How do communities negotiate their relationships with their traumatic past as they move towards development? How are geographies reimagined in the shift from trauma to development? I don't have, I need to warn you, I don't actually have an answer to this one. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. Uh, so you'll see the thinking process. And how does the affective narrative and or feminine affective agency affect space? So there are some very powerful female figures that you will see in this research. And how, how does that emotional load that they carry, many times unwillingly, how does that affect space? So the location, Lopetri. Uh, is in the middle of an area where on the west is the British basis, which restrict commercial exploitation of the land or the seafront, whereas in the east lie the most heavily exploited areas in terms of tourism infrastructure in Cyprus, that is Ayanapa and Protaras in the south exploited areas. Around the village, as well as in the area of the Potamos, which is the river, uh, there are several projects in progress. Uh, these projects aim to upgrade uh, the upgrade of areas around the village, moving from the focus on agriculture, which is what is practiced up to now, to focusing on the construction of new units for housing and to serve the tourism industry. So this is a map that's actually a little bit upside down. So because it, it refused to flip. 
So this is the C. This is Leopetri here. So if you can imagine the map like this. So speaking about spatial development. In the map, this is a map issued by the Ministry of Interior in 2022 of the Republic of Cyprus. Several things are visible. I'll try to point them out. Around the village in pale yellow is the zone for housing construction. So this is, oh crap. Okay, so pale yellow. So this is Lopetri, and this is the area of housing construction. The old village and the area of housing construction. Um, on the beachfront, the development in tourist uh, construction is in pale blue. So here is where tourist construction is going to happen, in the pale blue. Um, there is a national park in neon green, which is this area here. And the protected river basin and port area, which is uh, this one here. So this is the river area and the protected um, uh, port. So the reconstruction of the port area, so right now there's a reconstruction of the port area that's taking place as we speak, um, is interestingly referred to by journalists as the Cypriot Fjord. And it has started its planning in 2013. Uh, with a budget of 8 million euro, which is co-financed by the EU and the Republic of Cyprus. So the, image, the images below indicate the area uh, of the project. So this is kind of the river, and that's the whole area of the project. So this is at the moment being reconstructed, and the area is completely closed off for the, for the public. Uh, and the visuals below uh, are used by the local press to demonstrate the vision of the area from the present to the future. According to the press, the work has started in the area in 2020. So the whole process started in 2013, and in 2020 they started the works. And it was projected to finish in March 2023, but delays have, yet, have meant that it is still now, today in September 2023, unfinished. The press presents updates on the progress of the work, presented uh, updates on the progress of the work in January 2023, when then President Nikos Anastasiadis places the founding stone of the works in the port. If you remember the press in the, the Greek speaking press, for a time there was a lot of openings happening by Anastasiadis in different places. This was actually, this was one of them. So he went three years uh, after the official opening of the works to set the founding stone. In his speech, Anastasiadis mentions the following. Some months ago, the late Kyriakos Tsikoras, the Trisokas, who was the Leopetri Mukhtar that passed, had hosted me in the fish tavern, which is here. Unfortunately, at the time, I had not checked whether the work was underway. I had then told him that I would make the inauguration myself. And he told me, Mr. President, the works have not started yet. It was then that I, I, that I was shocked, and I did everything humanly possible. I intervened where I needed to so that we can stand here today at this, at this level of advanced construction. So he intervened so the, the works would finally start. So we can make several points, we can take several points from this short excerpts from the speech. That the realization of the implementation of the project was based on the personal relationship between two men, the president and the Muhtar. The fact that the president was very comfortable admitting that the system is broken, that he alone can fix it. And the importance of the posthumous acknowledgement as that relates to the late Mukhtar, that the work, the inspiration of the work was his, and it was actually realized by someone who appreciated him. And I'm just gonna close that. Um, it's just, it was interesting finding uh, this specific narrative co coming from uh, another type of very gendered approach. So, moving to part B. Uh, part B is living geographies. So what we have till now were, was projections, the idea of development, maps. So living geographies, in the context of qualitative research that I conducted, interviews took place in Ljobetri in April 2023. 
I spoke with several individuals from the village, five men and women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, living in Liopetri, Nicosia, Liopetri, Coma, Nicosia, and Liopetri, and abroad. Interviews were conducted in the village itself in the context of a walking tour of the village. My liaison and companion, Andreas, allowed for the interviews to be organic and for trust to be established from the onset. The interviews were informal, and although questions were addressed to the interviewees, much of the uh, conversation was guided by uh, ongoing changes, not only in the Bodamos, so there was a lot of concern about the changes in the village. This was kind of a continuous uh, concern for, for the people there. But in general, uh, but in general, kind of the, the societal changes that people noticed. So interviewees were concerned with the development outside the core of the village, their own inaccessibility to the river, to Potamos, as the area had been closed off, as well as the changes made to public monuments, the monument of the hay barn, the Ajironas, that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, okay. So the interviewees were also concerned with the changing socioeconomic situation of the village. They noted that Liobedri was an agricultural community, with basket weaving being a local crab that yielded profits for many families, a crab that had stopped being practiced. The other source of income for families was a river and fishing, uh, with mostly men but also some women supporting the family, their families and complementing their income through fishing. Walking around in the village, one could see the visual representation of the change in the composition of the population. An influx of refugees from the north of the island came to live in the refugee settlement in the village from the, from the late 1970s, whereas in the 1980s and 1990s, migration from the village was prominent due to the increased poverty in Liobedri and the decline in agriculture. At the same time, when uh, total touristification was taking place in Ayanaba and Brotaraz, in Liobedri, rural architecture of the, of the Cyprus plain was disappearing in a different way. It was being replaced by new concrete constructions in private houses. Few mud brick houses remain, uh, with new one and two story houses replacing them or uh, downgrading them to storehouses. So these are two examples that I saw. So the, the older constructions, which were now store, storage houses, and the newer houses side by side. So, Moving on to what became my main concern and my main topic of investigation. From geography, from geography to memory and trauma. Uh, however, in as many Greek Cypriots, uh, uh, as many Greek Cypriots uh, have engraved in their collective memory, uh, the central location uh, in the village, of the village, and that lies in its heart is of this, these crossroads is the, the Hironas, the barn, the hay barn. The site lies on these crossroads next to the coffee shops and the church on the juncture of the roads which lead to Sodira and Frenaros to the east, the Potamos, the river to the south, and Xilofau and Avoru to the west. So the Hironas is a site of memory. It's a site of memory commemorating the death of four Eoka fighters on uh, September 2nd, 1958 at the hands of, of the British colonial forces. Four men, Andreas Garios, Fodis Pitas, Ilias Papagiriagou, and Christos Samaras, who were in hiding in the barn, were killed in battle with the British forces. The ideological load on the site, the whole village, and, it, and its people is significant, since it's um, considered to be a sacred place, uh, a place of sacrifice uh, for high ideals, for fighting the British ruler and aspiring to union with Greece. Um, so I, what I was going to show is an introduction to a clip. Um, eh, but uh, if you guys want to find it yourselves, in Greek it's called Iskitaldromia du Thanato. It was a clip that was done by CYBC, the state channel. Um, in 1979, and the first few minutes give a very clear idea of the ideological load of the barn. So the background of the official story, and this is something that I started to develop as I was speaking with, uh, with people, the background of the official story unravels another narrative, and it involves Christos Samaras, who was one of the commemorated heroes, and his brother, Ilias Samaras, a Neoka fighter as well. Ilias was the man who had informed the British of the location of the four men in the barn and was deemed a traitor. 
Ilya Samaras, a few uh, months after the incident, was killed by Oga for his act of betrayal. The families of the two men both remained in the village, with their widows and children coexisting in the space. When uh, critically uh, counter-positioning geography with memory and trauma, there were two points which emerged strongly as reflections. And please take them as reflections and not as their final analysis. analysis. There's so much more to be said about this than what, I have, than what I have here. So the first relates to a spot, uh, to the spot where the body of Elias was taken after his killing for his family and the whole village to see. So on November 21st, 1958, the body was collected by his brother Andreas, according to yoga instructions. This location was narrated as being outside the village where the body was collected, um, in the location of Kutruvina, in the orchard of someone called Kosma Nikolas. And the body was then taken to another location, which was called Isikua du Kseni, which translates to the, the, fig, the little fig tree of Xenis, which was a location within the, the vicinity of the village. At that point, his wife and others visited him there before he was taken away again. In the present day, the location where, where Elias Hamaras was taken by his brother Andreas is close to the center of the village. In the interviews, the location was mentioned with hesitation as to exactly where it was today. It was a little bit lost in people's recollection. We came across, across it in, while walking around the village, and the location was confirmed by a now, by a now elderly uh, neighbor. Uh, that lived kind of across the street. Uh, and she also remembers the incident. She remembers that night. She narrated it to us. She pointed at the root of the electricity pole and identified the spot where the fig tree was and where the body was laid. A site of banal trauma. The second point relates to the story as that is being told by the widow of Ilya Samaras herself. In the TV interview taken on February 26, 1991 for the state channel CYBC by journalist Tagis Khajigiorgiu and the broadcast Horis Plesia. And this is a picture from, from the interview. In the interview taken by Khajigiorgiu, hosted the interview, hosted the widow of Ilya Samaras Dimitra and his brothers Andreas and Modestos. The interviewer focuses on getting to the real story in a clear effort to exonerate the late Elias Samares of his reputation as a traitor, as the man who had given away the hiding spot of the four Eoka men in the barn in Lobedri, which then resulted in their death. The interviewer and the two brothers narrated the story, both from their own personal experience, the written testimony of Elias Samares, which was written on November 3rd, 1958, his letters, as well as documents associated to the leader of Yoka himself, General uh, Yorios Rivas de Yenis. The story focuses on the fact that Elias was brutally tortured by the British authorities in order to betray the whereabouts of his Yoga comrades, even with the use of hallucinogenic, of a hallucinogenic liquid. As narrated, Elias could not forgive himself, and although he was taken to the United Kingdom for his own protection for fear of retaliation by Oka, he returned to Cyprus of his own free will. He wanted to return to Cyprus and give himself in, surrender to Eoga. Upon their return, masked individuals came to take him from his house. And when they asked why he returned, he responded, and this gave me, gives me goosebumps, and I'm sorry to do this, but he said, uh, I'm going to say it in, in Greek first, I want a bullet from my Eoga. With the direct order of the Eoga leader, Ilya Samaras was killed a few days after his return. The fate of his body is described above, taken to a field outside the village, then to another location inside the village, and then uh, was buried in an unmarked grave in the village cemetery. The telling of the story is very emotional for all of the interviewees. At moments throughout the interview, their voices break. Uh, they pause as they speak and tears are visible. However, the narrative of the men, the brothers and the journalist, is visibly different than that of Dimitra Samara. The journalist and the brothers state what happened and where, are concerned with the facts, and use space in a utilitarian way. 
Locations are for them the sites of events. In the case of the widow, she also spoke about her emotional state. The geography of the space was connected with her personal trauma in which the community, including yoga, participated and dictated her experience of the space. So when Elias, I, I picked two, three um, lines that she said, when Elias uh, told Dimitra while they were in the UK that he wanted to return to Cyprus and give himself to yoga, the commentator asked her if she objected. To that she replied, I loved, I loved him so much that I, could not say, that I could not say the opposite. When she's taken to see the body in the small fig tree, she says, and there we saw him alone under the small fig tree. We stayed until the afternoon and then, and again, masked people came and took him. And the third one, Dimitra Samara was not allowed to attend the funeral or the 40 day memorial. She was allowed to go visit the grave six months after the funeral. She was not allowed so that, quote from her, people would not be scandalized. In Greek, And just my overall recap. This has been an exercise in zooming into a community in an effort to find the connection between the space of Lopetri and its people as they advance towards a future of development. From the general area to the Potamos, to the river, and back to the heart of the village, everything is changing. The outlet of the village towards the coast through the river area is a relationship that seems to have dried out in the past 50 years, savoring links to the past, rendering the space of Lopetri a nation-centric space, with the Potamos only offering itself as a space of recreation and development, something for outsiders to enjoy at least for people with means. The links, to the, communi the links of the community to that area, uh, as have the arts and crafts, such as basket weaving by the women, have withered, with the latter close to disappearing. What we have seen from the conversations and the archival material is that the space carries deep narratives of trauma, as those are manifested in the patriarchal structures that deprive Leopetri and the Bodamos a voice of how development will be carried out and the invisible traumas of the past. The sociocultural identity of Lopetri and the role of women crystallized through their relationship with the geography, with their vulnerability and open wounds remain at plain view but unnamed. The hegemonic narrative of nationalism and patriotism remains strong in the, in the public sphere and the visual culture of the village and the Greek Cypriot community as a whole. Patriarchy and gender roles remain strong and clear in the village, dominating the public uh, spaces with the monument of the barn, the hay barn, the Ahironas, right in the middle. And because I didn't want to end like on a very depressing note, I <laughs> this is a small game uh, that I made and it's pictures from the village uh, coffee shops and houses. It's called Latspot Garivas. There were so many uh, portraits of him in the village. It was crazy. So that's it from me. Thank you very much.